We'll be looking in Ephesians chapter 4 today. <clears throat> Being Father's Day, I had to have to tell this one. There was a boy who was uh, showing his friend around the house and he showed him the different rooms. He says, this is a uh, this is our living room, and these are our bedrooms, and, and this is our den. And the other boy said, well, we don't have a den. He said, you don't have a den? He said, no. He said, our dad just growls in every room. <laughs> there was a lady at the hardware store and she was complaining she was complaining about everything she'd pick up one thing and she'd find some kind of fault with it oh this this is the, the paint's wearing off of this or uh, this looks old doesn't look like it's brand new uh, what good is this going to do? And she would find fault with everything she picked up. Finally, the clerk was getting kind of tired of it, and he says, well, ma'am, why don't you go look in the brooms? We've got a new set of brooms come in. See how you like them. So she went over, and she started looking in the brooms, and she started finding fault with them. She says, oh, she said, look at here. There's got... The, the, the handles are too rough and the, the uh, straw is not very good in the, be in the brooms. And she says, what good are these? He said, well, ma'am, you could use them for flying. You know, some people have a tendency to find fault with everything. And some have a tendency to find fault with the system without seeing their own role in the system especially when it comes to politics and government such seems to be the case with Solomon who has the list of complaints as we see here in Ecclesiastes I want to read his complaints here in chapter 4 Again I looked and saw all the oppression that was taking place under the sun. I saw the tears of the oppressed, and they have no comforter. Power was on the side of their oppressors, and they have no comforter. And I declared that the dead who have already died are happier than the living who are still alive. But better than both is he who has not yet been, who has not seen the evil that is done under the sun. And I saw that all labor and all achievement spring from man's envy of his neighbor. This too is meaningless, a chasing after the wind. The fool folds his hand and ruins himself. Better one handful with tranquility than two handfuls with toil and chasing after the wind. Again, I saw something meaningless under the sun. There was a man alone. He had neither son nor brother. There was no end to his toil, yet his eyes were not content with his wealth. For whom am I toiling, he asked, and why am I depriving myself of enjoyment? This too is meaningless, a miserable business. Two are better than one because they have a good return for their work. If one falls down, his friend can help him up. But pity the man who falls and has no one to help him up. Also, if two lie down together, they'll keep warm. But how can one keep warm alone? Though one may be overpowered, two can defend themselves. A cord of three strands is not quickly broken. 
better a poor but wise youth than an old but foolish king who no longer knows how to take warning. The youth may have come from prison to the kingship or he may have been born in poverty within his kingdom. I say that all who live, I saw that all who lived and walked under the sun followed the youth, the king's successor. There was no end to all the people who were before them. But those who came later were not pleased with his successor. This too is meaningless, a chasing after the wind. Solomon's complaints. Number one, he complained because the people were oppressed. And he said they're oppressed, oppressed to the point to tears. They're crying. They're weeping. One thing you have to remember, though, is as you read this, Solomon's not just any wise man. He's not just any teacher. And he's not without power or influence in the political realm. Solomon's the king of Israel. He's the absolute dictator. He's the top of the food chain. He's in control. And that's why his words are so paradoxical. If there is oppression in the land, it must somehow be his fault. He is either the perpetrator or the oppressor or the facilitator of it. That is, he's either the one doing the oppressing or he is allowing it to go on unhindered. It may be some of his lesser officials who've been doing this. But they're his officials acting under his power and authority. Who's responsible in such cases? You know, that question was addressed at the Nuremberg trials. And these trials were held after World War II to determine who was guilty of the war crimes committed against humanity at the concentration camps in Nazi Germany. Who all was culpable of all the deaths? Who was held guilty? Who was it that had, who was it? Those who had just, uh, just those who had ordered it done, were they were the ones to be held guilty? Or also uh, the ones who pulled the trigger to be held guilty? Or were just the ones who pulled the trigger to be held guilty and not those who ordered it? Who was guilty? Solomon was king and he was in control of everything, including the enslaving of many of his own countrymen. At first, he may have used the building of God's temple as an excuse to enslave workers. But then he used forced labor to build palaces for himself and for some of his wives. And then he began a large public construction program. Solomon complained that the oppression was so great that it brought tears to the eyes of the oppressed. And he says there's no comforter. But Solomon's wrong. He was wrong. Besides being the one who could have done something about it himself, it doesn't that sound kind of familiar sometimes? We see people who, who complain about the way things are, but they don't do anything to change things. Solomon says there's no comforter, but he forgot about what his father had taught him, David. He forgot about Psalm 23. Thy rod and thy staff, they comforted me. He forgot that the Lord God is the comforter of Israel, that God is there in Israel, 
there in Jerusalem. He's the God that's there. Ezra chapter 48. God is the comforter. Solomon complains, but he does nothing to help the situation. He puts me in mind of people today who just love to complain. He fails to realize that he has a responsibility to do what he, whatever he can to help. You know, later on in the New Testament, Jesus told the parable of the Good Samaritan. A man met with a mishap. Some robbers attacked him and stole his money after brutally beating him and left him on the side of the road. A priest passed by without stopping to help in any way. Likewise, a Levite passed by without stopping, no help. Then a Hispanic in an old Ford truck stopped by and took him to the Comfort Inn and bandaged the man's wounds and nursed him back to health. Who was obeying God's command? Comfort, comfort my people, says God in Isaiah 40. Solomon saw the misery of his people and he walked on the other side of the road. He distanced himself from the problem. He did nothing to help. And he also saw that power was on the side of the oppressors. But he speaks as if he is an innocent bystander, just observing and not involved. These people have no one to help them, no relief in sight. He sees that the dead are better off. And those that are not born are better off still. What Solomon fails to mention, again, is that he is a despot, a dictator. He's a czar. He's the power of the throne. That power rests with him. And he's in control. He has the power over everyone's life. Life and death are in his hands. And he could use that power not to be an oppressor. Solomon then turns his complaining in another direction. He starts complaining about a man trying to eke out a decent living. He says that the motives for all he does, all the hard work, all his, his achievements are just out of envy. He says, that's all it is. Why does a man work? Because he's envious of someone else. He just wants what somebody else has got. So he works. But he says, oh, that's better than the fool who ruins himself. Because a fool Money in the hands of a fool is no good because a fool desires no wisdom. Solomon complains. He complains about the envy. He complains about greed. He said, everybody's greedy. He begins to complain. And he says, why are people so greedy? He said, it's better to have just one handful than to have two handfuls with hard work. One handful with a little piece. That's all you need. You don't need to have it all.
There were two brothers who had started one Tasty Freeze fast food stand that did so well that they expanded and they opened another and another and another until finally they had five Tasty Foods, Tasty Freezes. But the two Woodward brothers had no peace, no rest, just work, work, work. And they said that they wished they still just had the one. Not as much money, but a lot more peace. A lot more peace. Said, be content with what you have. Solomon, in the midst of his complaining, gave a little good advice. But Solomon, in the midst of his complaining, failed to take God into consideration. He failed to realize the, God, the comfort that God gives us. And God is the God of all comfort, as we find in the New Testament. We find that in 2 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 3 through 5. Praise be to the God of our, and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of compassion and the God of all comfort, who comforts us in all our troubles so that we can comfort those in any trouble with the comfort we ourselves have received in God. For just as the sufferings of Christ flow into our lives, so also through Christ our comfort flows, overflows. And we have to realize God gives us comfort. We don't have to be like Solomon and complain about everything. We need to realize that we don't need to have everything. We need to realize that sometimes we need to back off a little bit and recognize that some things are a little bit more important than having it all. Because having it all in this world means not having it all in the next world. Where would you rather have it all? That's the question you have to ask yourself. Where would I rather have it all? Here in the present or with God? It's not wrong to be rich. It's not wrong to have things. But it's wrong to drive yourself to the point that you leave everything out that's important. It's wrong to drive yourself to the point to where family's not as important, to where church is not as important, God is not as important. That work is not that important. It's important, but not that important. Don't let work drive you. It's a tool, an instrument. And being Father's Day, it's a good time to think about that. We're going to have an invitation. Let me tell you this. <clears throat> when I look back on my life, If there's one thing I realize when I look back, I find that I was a very sinful human being. Very sinful. And I find that Jesus Christ came into my life and he changed me and he saved me. He didn't say I had to straighten my life out first. 
he came into my life first and saved me. And then he began working on me. And he's still working on me. And he's got a lot of to do. And he can change your life. And he can turn you around. If you let him. Question is, will you let him? We're going to have that invitation. We'll please stand and turn to page 497.